Well, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible reading today is from Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 to 23. You can find that in your service sheets. If you've printed them off, follow along in your Bibles at home or on the screen in front of you, and then we'll spend a bit of time uh, in that together. Colossians 2, 16 to 23. Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is the Messiah. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on ascetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. He doesn't hold on to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons, develops with growth from God. If you died with Christ to the elemental forces of this world, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these regulations refer to what is destroyed by being used up. They're human commands and doctrines. Although these have a reputation of wisdom by promoting ascetic practices, humility and severe treatment of the body, they're not of any value against fleshly indulgence. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, there's an outline there in your service sheets and you can follow along there or if you'd like, uh, just take some notes and use the comments box down the bottom of the page and uh, we'll try to respond to any questions that you might have uh, based on today's passage. A golf's one of the few sports that I don't enjoy playing or watching. I, I love the quote reputedly to come from Oscar Wilde that golf is a walk in the park interrupted. However, I do enjoy reading about golf and golfers, perhaps because it's a world that I'll never inhabit. Uh, golfers, I'm told, often go through something called the yips. Uh, they lose their form and they start to play badly. A brilliant golfer becomes a Bernard Gabbard in a matter of weeks. What might start with a physiological issue becomes a mental issue. Are the players consumed by doubts, deceived about their abilities? They start looking for solutions. Now, it seems to me from what I've read that golfers go in one of two directions. Uh, On the one hand, they turn to increased practice, spending hours and hours and hours working on their putting, their swing, their stance, anything that might undo their predicament, restore them to confidence by doing more. Uh, On the other hand they start to consult more and more obscure professional coaches. They move from one guru to another, from one legend to another. Any amount of increased knowledge, knowing more, to turn their game around. In the yips, reduced to being a hack, doubting the raw truth of what they can do, who they really are, a troubled golfer turns to doing more and knowing more. Now you see it time and time again. Ian Baker Finch, Tiger Woods, Greg Norman, Nick Faldo, Rory McIlroy, the list can go on. Uh, More work, more knowledge. More and more work, more and more knowledge. They're the ways out of this area where their reality, the reality of their skills is doubted and their form crumbles. Seems to me that the Christians in Colossae are facing the theological equivalent of the yips being led down a path that doubts what they have, the raw reality, down the path to alternatives to the truth being offered, alternatives that will have them doing more or knowing more. They're facing a false teaching which creates doubts about the truth that Jesus as Lord is enough. And last week we saw how Paul dealt with that lie by taking these people in Colossae back to the raw truth, the reality. If Jesus is your Lord, you're in him. And if you're in him, you have all that you need. His story is now your story. And they have life at its fullest. In these verses, verses 16 to 23, Paul and Timothy now turn their attention to what the false teachings are suggesting about how these Christians must live. If Jesus is Lord is not enough, then... At its base, the false teachers seem to be saying something like this. 
Jesus is Lord is not enough. That means that your sins are not forgiven. That means that you really don't know God. Therefore, let us show you what you need to do, what you need to know. You just need to do more. You just need to know more. And if you don't, there's no eternal inheritance for you. We can sometimes face that same issue today, can't we? And once the idea that Jesus is enough is doubted, once the raw reality of what we have in him is forgotten or dimmed, then what can we do? We still ought to deal with our sin. We still desperately need to know God. Well, the only possible solution that we're often offered is to do more and know more, to make up by ourselves for what is lacking in what we think Jesus offers. And as we're about to see, Paul has one answer to all this. That's a pack of lies. Jesus is Lord is enough. It's all been done for you and you can know God fully. Let me pray and then we'll dive into the passage. Dear God, thanks for these words. I thank you for Paul and Timothy, Paul in jail, Timothy with him as they write this letter to people they've never met, a people who heard the good news about Jesus from Epaphras. I thank you for Epaphras bringing a report to Paul and Timothy. Thank you that this letter was written and preserved and, and in it we have your revelation. Father, we pray that by your spirit this revelation will take dwelling in us, change us as we understand more about what we have in Jesus and the falsity of what is so often offered. We pray this in his name. Amen. Well, I'm at point two on the outline. Are the Christians in Colossae are doing well as God's people? Are the reputation for love and faith has spread right throughout the world? Are they growing in their identity as people transferred into the kingdom of God's Son? They're being transformed as God's people. Paul and Timothy pray for more of this. Paul and Timothy have reminded the Colossians that Jesus is Lord. is able to do all of this for them to reconcile them to God, to transfer their eternal postcode, to completely transform them. They've reminded the Colossians of their work as servants of the gospel, the good news of who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and how it's spread virally right throughout the world, and that they've been given this job for the benefit of the Colossians, for all of God's people. But there remains a danger Colossians chapter 2, verse 4, I'm saying this so that no one will deceive you with persuasive arguments. Seems that there's an alternative being offered to the Christians in Colossae. It's an alternative, it seems, that says Jesus is Lord is not enough. It is persuasive. And Paul and Timothy have made clear the key principle for how to deal with this alternative. Remember Colossians 2, 6 and 7, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith just as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Jesus as Lord is enough. It's how they began. It's how they are to continue, how they are to finish. In Jesus they have everything they need. Remember Colossians 1, 21 to 22. Remember Colossians 2, verse 3. And now Paul and Timothy turn to look at this alternative in closer detail. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elemental forces of this world and not based on Christ. What is being offered as an alternative is clearly not based on Christ. Paul and Timothy say that. It's something that says Jesus is Lord is not enough. Uh, now, when you think about it, and Paul and Timothy do over those next few verses, verses 9 to 15, and Neil helped us look at those last week, to be connected to Jesus, to be in him, to be with him, is to have everything you need as a human being. To put it bluntly, to be in Jesus is to have life at its fullest, is to be part of God's people, is to be made alive, to have your sins forgiven, and it's all publicly verifiable. As Neil so memorably helped us understand and remember last week, his story is now your story. 
Everything about Jesus' life is now yours. So what's the alternative? What's being offered? And the alternative is a notorious area of debate. Uh, reams of paper, gallons of ink, uh, much theological sweat and verbiage has been spent on working out what this persuasive argument is, this philosophy and empty deceit. Well, let me tell you what we do know. In verse 8, it seems to put humans back in the centre of life. It's based on human tradition. In verse 8, it puts this world back in the centre of life. It deals with life from the perspective of a broken world, the world that we live in. It expresses these two ideas through an exhortation to do more, to obey rules, to deal with our human situation through more and excessive activity, to deal with our human nature through rigorous denial and strict behaviour. Just look at verse 16 and verses 20 to 23. We'll do that in a second. It expresses these two ideas not only through an exhortation to do more but also an exhortation to know more, to access secret and privileged knowledge. Secret and privileged actions, just look at verse 18, and we will in a second. In essence, the alternative seems to be a mishmash of ideas taken from all sorts of sources, and it seems to be saying, we can only read between the lines here, seems to be saying, Jesus as Lord is not enough. He cannot deal with your sinful nature, so you must do more to rein it in. He cannot give you the knowledge of God that you need, so you must access secret knowledge. Well, how do Paul and Timothy deal with this alternative? I'm at point three on the outline. Uh, Paul and Timothy are very clear in the structure of how they deal with this dangerous deceit. They make a command and then they expose the dangerous deceit, the false teaching. They make a command then they expose the dangerous deceit, the false teaching, and then they make a personal application laying the truth out for their readers. That's the structure of this passage. Uh, in this sense, they are very clear. The dangerous deceit, the persuasive argument, the empty lies offer nothing except the opposite of whatever Jesus has achieved. And the first command is in verse 16. Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food or drink or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Whatever else this persuasive deceit and teaching is, it's divisive. It decides who is in the kingdom of God based on what rules they keep and what their diary looks like and it excludes those who don't keep the right rules, who don't keep the right diary dates. It judges decides who's in or out based on people's behaviour. If this is not that clear, Paul and Timothy then clarify it in verse 17 as they expose it. These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance, the reality is the Messiah. Whatever else this persuasive teaching is, it's legalistic. It emphasises that Jesus has not done enough to deal with our sins, so we need to do more, add more to Jesus by a set of rules and regulations and diary dates you've got to keep. Put simply, humans can deal with sin by keeping a set of rules and regulations which limit the consumption of food and drink, which monitors our days and our times and what we do with them. It seems to be part of a much bigger set of rules and regulations down there in verse 20 or others, which aims to deal with the danger of sin by doing more, by avoiding more, by keeping more, by being more law-abiding in a religious sense. Paul and Timothy want their readers, want us, to know how useless this is. On the one hand, there's a fundamental misunderstanding of sin lying under this teaching. Remember how we've decide, defined sin? It's the attitude and action that says, I am God and God is not. It's an internal problem that's revealed in behaviour. It's not something bad out there that comes in and infects us that we've got to keep at bay, kind of like a virus. That's the very point that Jesus is dealing with in our reading from Mark 7. Sin is not a thing out there. It's the very nature of our human hearts. Sin is not dealt with by more rigorous laws and rule-keeping and better dishwashing. 
it must be dealt with at the very core of our human nature. On the other hand, there are shadows throughout the history of God's dealing with humanity which point to a time where God will do as he has promised. He'll roll back sin and bring his approval. The dangerous deceit, this persuasive teaching, it seems, has returned to these laws from the past, probably Old Testament laws, Old Testament dates, Old Testament festivals, and misunderstood, misapplied them. Those laws were never given to fix sin. Those laws were given to God's people so they could represent God to the world and as they did that, they revealed how far short humans, even the people of God, how far short humans fall of being perfect image bearers of God. Even as God gave his people these laws so that they could represent him to the world, those very same laws revealed their complete failure their complete sin. Those laws pointed forward to a time when God himself would deal with human nature and deal with the sin at the core of our being. And if you remember, Paul has just reminded us of how that happens in verse 11. In him you are also circumcised with a circumcision not done with hands by the putting off of the body of flesh in the circumcision of the Messiah. In Jesus Christ, the reality, the fullness, the substance of God dealing with our human nature has taken place. As a human, Jesus is everything we could never be. He is perfect. He lived perfection for us. So because he did that, We don't have to do more to have our sins dealt with because Jesus did everything. We don't have to do more. He's dealt with our broken and rebellious and sinful nature for us by being what we could not be, the one human who is perfect. And so by being connected to him through faith, as we heard last week, any human can have all of his perfection all that he has done, have their nature transformed. Why then, Paul and Timothy seem to be saying, why then would you swap that for a return to laws that pointed to that? Why would you return to fruitless activity that does nothing about your nature when Jesus has done everything about your nature? Why would you swap it? Well, the second command is in verse 18. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on ascetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm and inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. Again, this persuasive teaching, this dangerous deceit is divisive. It disqualifies some and it brings others in. Again, it's hard to pin it down. There's much debate about its precise form. But I think we can say this much. It offers changed behaviour through exclusive and special knowledge. These people seem to delight in the fact that they think they've had a special insight, a special revelation, a special knowledge that goes beyond what's freely available in Jesus Christ. That's changed their behaviour so that now they worship angels, carry out certain rigorous acts of behaviour, insist on your need to have this very same knowledge and this very same behaviour. Alongside their encouragement to do more, These people insist that others need to know more. And again, Paul and Timothy expose the reality of this. Look again at verse 18. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on ascetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. He doesn't hold on to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons, develops with growth from God. These people have become separated from the head, from the source of all the knowledge anyone needs. Remember who the head is? Remember Colossians 1, 18? Remember that in Jesus is all the fullness of God? Remember that in Jesus are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden? Remember that in Jesus humans can be made full and mature and presented before God as faultless? 
in Jesus, there is complete knowledge of God, of sin, of salvation, of life, of yourself, of the world, of the point of existence. To offer a return to human-focused knowledge, to unique one-off experiences, well, that's just to trade the only one who is fully God for a puffed-up mind that is arrogant created within our own grey matter. Why would you do that swap? Well, there's a summary of all of this, this dangerous deceit and persuasive teaching in verses 20 to 23. If you die with Christ to the elemental forces of this world, why do you live as if you still belong to this world? Why do you submit to regulations, don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? All these regulations refer to what is being destroyed by being used up. They are human commands and doctrines. Although these have a reputation of wisdom by promoting ascetic practices, humility and severe treatment of the body, they're not of any value against fleshly indulgence. Uh, There's a change here in how Paul and Timothy write. Uh, It moves to a direct address to the Colossians as a group, you, you people, rather than warning about a third person. And the point's not complicated. Put simply, Paul and Timothy lay down a very clear exhortation before their readers. If you are connected to Jesus... If in him you've been transferred and transformed, if your postcode has changed and if Jesus is all you need, why are you trading it in? Why are you returning to stuff that you know doesn't work? Uh, In essence, Paul and Timothy close by drawing the threads together. In Jesus, your eternal postcode has changed. You've been transferred and transformed. In Jesus, his life is your life. In Jesus, all your sinful nature is dealt with. In Jesus, you know God and have full knowledge that you need. In Jesus, well, why would you go back to stuff that doesn't work? I'm at point four on the outline. At the heart of the golfing yips is doubt about what the golfer has is enough. There's a doubt about the raw reality. They start to doubt what they have and then they strive harder and they seek more enlightened advice and the downward spiral goes. The warning here is quite clear. In Jesus as Lord, you have enough. Don't be taken away by dangerous deceit, by persuasive ideas that say Jesus isn't enough. Dangerous ideas that offer more strenuous activity more exclusive knowledge that say you must do more and know more because Jesus didn't do enough and through Jesus you don't know God. That's the false teaching. Now before I suggest three applications, let me be very clear about what I am not saying. I'm not saying that the Christian life is to be devoid of commands and obedience and a desire for deeper knowledge. I mean, Paul prays all that in Colossians 1, verse 9 and following. But these must be in their right place. Good deeds, rigorous behaviour, these are not the way to deal with the sin inside us. Greater knowledge, more exclusive knowledge, is not the way to know God. No, Christ's deeds are the way our sin is dealt with. Christ's nature is where we know God. Jesus has done enough, has done everything to deal with our human sinful nature and in Jesus there is the fullest revelation of God. But once you are saved by the Lordship of Jesus, once we have fullness once we have forgiveness of sins, once we are brought into the kingdom of God's Son whom he loves, once we have new life, once we are made faultless and blameless in him, then we strive by the help of God to live more like the one whose image we bear and we dive more deeply into the knowledge of the one whose image we bear. So let's turn to those three brief Applications to close. 
First, we must continue to grasp the significance of being in Jesus. That is such an incredible truth that in him, his story is now your story. That should never be dimmed. That should always be treasured. That should be wonderfully enjoyed. I want to suggest to you that a fruitful activity this week might be each day to write down a benefit of being in Jesus, a benefit clearly expressed in the word of God. In that sense, you're really enjoying the first word of today's passage, therefore. The therefore reminds us of everything we have by being in Jesus that Neil helped unpack last week so that nothing else seems persuasive. Nothing else seems to add to the sufficiency of Jesus. In him, we have all we need for life at its fullest, forgiveness, reconciliation, restoration, transformation, a future hope, maturity, the fullness of true humanity. That is so much to delight in, to luxuriate in, to be satisfied by. Secondly, we must be aware of the danger of the persuasive argument the dangerous deceit. In that sense, our two other readings from Genesis 3 and Mark 7 are so important. In Genesis 3, we're shown how easy it is to doubt the sufficiency and perfection of God's provision. You're there in the Garden of Eden at the start of all creation and God has given you everything in the universe and we doubt that it's enough. In Mark 7, we're reminded of where the true source of dissatisfaction and doubt lies. It lies inside the human heart, not in some deficiency in God himself or his promises or action. Sin, thinking that we can be God instead of God because we don't think he's got our best interests at heart, sin can never be dealt with. That attitude can never be dealt with. That action can never be quelled by stricter rules by greater effort, by more exclusive knowledge. Sin can only be dealt with at the core of our humanity and that can only be dealt with by the one who is truly human and God, the one we sin against, Jesus. In that sense, a faulty understanding of sin, a faulty understanding of the goodness of God and his promises, a faulty understanding of the nature of Jesus and our nature, these are the seedbed for the persuasive arguments to grow in. So I guess the prayers that Paul prayed back in Colossians chapter 1, especially Colossians 1, 9 to 12, and I guess that general principle in Colossians 2, 6 to 7 are critical, aren't they? Critical bulwarks against the persuasiveness of this dangerous deceit. My question to you is this. Have you applied them, that prayer and that principle, practically in you? Third, following on from what I've just said, we must be careful of where we get our knowledge and growth and insight into Jesus and his sufficiency, where we get it from. At its most foundational level, the baseline for anything is expressed clearly in verse 8. It must be on Christ. Uh, At the next level up, we need to make sure that what we do read and what we do devour and what we do watch is stuff that affirms the sufficiency of Christ in the Bible, that he is the reality to which everything points, that he is the Lord And so his story is our story, that what he has done is complete, sufficient, efficient, and never deficient. And so if we're in him, so are we. And then at the next level up, how that stuff is communicated needs to affirm these truths and their fullness, how that truth is communicated. In this sense, we must keep asking ourselves as we read and think and ponder and listen and watch, is what I'm learning on Christ? Is what I'm learning according with what the Bible says is in Christ? Is what I'm learning and devouring increasing my satisfaction in his sufficiency alone as my Lord? Let me pray. 
Dear God, thanks for your word. Uh, Thank you for this expose of false teaching, the false teaching that says Jesus is Lord is not enough and you need to do more and know more. Father, thank you that Jesus has done everything. He is the fulfilment of all the promises of God. Thank you that in Jesus we have the full sufficient revelation of you. Thank you that brought together this deals with our sin and restores us to true humanity. Father, please help us not to stray. Please help us to delight in the sufficiency of what Jesus has done and to dive more deeply into the knowledge of you that we can have through him. In his name we pray. Amen.